Thanks everyone for joining today's live web chat on the Dream, Dream Act. Um, my name is Stephanie Valencia. I'm with the White House Office of Public Engagement. Um, and we're here uh, today to answer your questions about the Dream Act. I'm sitting in the Secretary of War Room here at the White House with Cecilia Munoz, the Director of Intergovernmental Affairs at the White House, Deputy Assistant to the President. She's also the President's, uh, one of his immigration policy advisors, has been doing this work for the last 20 years. She's going to go ahead and take uh, your questions and comments about the DREAM Act today. Um, so before we get started, I want to go ahead and have Cecilia give a brief uh, overview about what the DREAM Act is and what it isn't um, before we get to your questions and comments. Uh, Cecilia will answer that question and then we'll go ahead and do the live Q&A, both taking questions that were submitted ahead of time uh, on the Facebook uh, invite, but also um, uh, take your live questions. Um, please visit whitehouse.gov forward slash live to submit your questions now. So with that, Cecilia. Thanks very much, Stephanie. Thanks to everybody who's joining us. Uh, the DREAM Act is a part of the broader immigration agenda that is a priority for the president. What it does is deal with the proportion of the population that's here illegally who came as, uh, as young people, people, people who came, who were brought by their parents as children, who have grown up in this country, have succeeded uh, and want to go to college or to serve the country in the military. And what the DREAM Act does is provide those students with uh, protection. Uh, and a legal status that allows them to stay in the country, pursue their studies, pers and pursue or pursue service to the country. Um, it's been around for many years. It's had bipartisan support for many years. And the reason we're talking about it now is because we have an opportunity for a vote on the DREAM Act in the House and in the Senate during this congressional lame duck session. So we have an opportunity to pass the DREAM Act. This is a really pivotal time because it provides protection to students who did not choose to be in this country illegally. It's sort of based on this notion that you don't punish children for the actions of their parents. These are students who um, have done everything we've asked them to do. They've been successful. They want to move forward. They want to continue their contributions, continue their studies, or serve this country. Uh, and the DREAM Act gives them the opportunity to do that. We're expecting action in the House and uh, the Senate within the next several weeks. Uh, and so this is a really pivotal, pivotal time to be having this conversation. So we'll go ahead and take our first question. Uh, Eric Trasikoff asked, does the United States government agree that the DREAM Act qualified students could help the country remain competitive in the new world economy where diversity is key for success? Also, what are the negative aspects of the DREAM Act according to the President's administration, if there are any at all? Well, the President has been a supporter of the DREAM Act since his days in the Illinois State Senate, so it's something that he personally believes in very much and that the administration is strongly supporting. Uh, Secretary Duncan, for example, of the Department of Education has been uh, out there very visibly making the argument that uh, this is part of our agenda for competitiveness, that we're talking about not wasting talent. These are young people who have worked very hard, who have a real contribution to make. Uh, if you hear university presidents talking about the undocumented students that do have managed to go to college, uh, some of them are real stars. Um, and it just becomes clear as you learn about these individuals uh, that it makes no sense to slam the door of opportunity in their faces, that we have everything to gain as a country economically by making sure that everyone has the ability to reach their full potential, and the DREAM Act is very much part of that. So we don't see a downside to the DREAM Act. It's a piece of the broader immigration agenda. We have a lot to do to fix what's broken about our immigration system. But it's not just the DREAM Act students who, who are victimized by inaction as a country if, when we don't act we end up falling further behind because we're really depriving ourselves of the talents of these extraordinary people. Great. Our next question will come from Marilee Newton. While I support this, won't this make other people come in illegal to give their children the same chance? Will this be a one-time only offer? That's a great question. So the way the DREAM Act is structured, um, students who qualify have to have been in the country for five years and they have to have come to this country when they were been, been brought by their parents when they were 15 or younger. So you, in, the DREAM Act only applies to students who are already here. So you can't really make the argument that other people are going to come seeking the benefits of the DREAM Act because of the way the DREAM Act works. It's the population is clearly defined and limited and it's limited to folks who are already here and who have been here for quite some time. Great. Um, our next question from Chris Bartz. Do uh, they have to live in the United States for a predetermined time? If so, what is that before the DREAM Act is applicable? So the DREAM Act applies just to students who have been in the country for five years, um, and they have to have been brought by their parents when they were 15 or younger, 
And then there's also a number of other requirements. For example, they have to have not uh, been convicted of crimes. They have to show good moral character. There's a host of other things that they have to show that immigrants in general have to show in order to come to the United States. But again, it's important that it's a defined population. You can't make the argument that the DREAM Act will act as some kind of magnet for people to decide to come in the future. Can you maybe talk a little bit more about the military aspect component to it? Because I think that's something that folks don't realize. Yeah, and we're sitting in the Secretary of War room here in the White House, actually. So the, the two things you have to do, a DREAM Act student has to do prospectively in order to stay qualified for the protection they would receive is either go to college for, successfully for, for two years or serve in the military for two years. And we know because uh, DREAM Act advocates have, have shown us through their advocacy that there are a number of students who are interested in the DREAM Act as an opportunity to serve their country. They see this as their country. They've grown up here. And military service is an incredibly important element of the DREAM Act. In fact, it's part of the strategic plan of the Department of Defense. Uh, the DREAM Act is, is listed as part of the Defense Department strategic plan because it's important for our military readiness. Great. Um, Miriam Roke asks, what do you mean by pu stop punishing innocent young people for the actions of their parents? So that's a great question. So um, in the course of many years of advocacy on the DREAM Act and on immigration issues overall, an argument that we hear with some frequency is this notion that if people are here in violation of the law, they're lawbreakers and we should be applying the law and using every opportunity to deport everybody who's here illegally. Population that's here illegally is 10 million people, uh, and it doesn't, it just, it doesn't make sense. It doesn't, it's not practical to assume that we're going to be able to round up and deport 10 million people. Um, the DREAM Act students are a particularly compelling part of the undocumented population because they didn't make the choice to come here illegally. Um, they came as children, sometimes as infants. And I've met DREAM Act students who grew up in this country not ever realizing that they weren't Americans. Their parents never told them uh, the, the circumstances around their arrival. And they found out that they didn't have legal status when it was time to apply to college. They had been successful in high school. They would graduated in many cases with honors. And when they were applying to college and needed to provide the information for, for in-state tuition is the point at which they, their parents tell them, well, actually, you don't qualify because of the circumstances under which we brought you to this country. Um, uh, and the students end up shocked and in disbelief that they are not citizens of the only country they've ever known. And so one of the things that's fundamental to the DREAM Act is that even as we enforce our immigration laws, um, that we have to make choices. And it doesn't make sense to be expending enforcement resources on people who, if you, when you meet them, you kind of recognize as American students because they've grown up here. This is their country. Uh, and it doesn't make sense uh, to punish these students for the choices that their parents made by denying them an opportunity for in-state tuition in the states that they've grown up in or an opportunity to serve the only country that they've known through military service. So that's what we mean when we say that. So uh, Andrew Thebalt just asked, what are some of the major arguments against the DREAM Act and why do you think they're wrong? Um, we hear multiple things. The most common thing that we hear about the DREAM Act is that it's a, they, the, they use the A word. They call it an amnesty, that it's somehow uh, granting some kind of blanket protection uh, that people haven't earned. And the reason it's not an amnesty is because there are a whole host of requirements that students need to fulfill in order to qualify for the DREAM Act, especially the qualification that they have to go on uh, to study uh, in higher education or serve in the military for a couple of years. Plus, they have to demonstrate good moral character and other, uh, meet other qualifications that immigrants need to meet. Um, we don't believe it qualifies as an amnesty. Um, and it's not. The other argument that we hear that relates to this amnesty argument is that it's rewarding people who have broken the law. And again, as I said in, in response to the previous question, these students didn't, make, didn't choose to break the law. In fact, they did everything everybody asked them to do by being successful students. Um, so those are principal arguments that we hear. We also hear uh, arguments that, it's, that in, in uh, economic hard times, that it might not make sense to be providing this kind of benefit to people who are here without immigration status. But again, if you look at what happens to people uh, if they don't have an opportunity to, be, to pursue their studies or to serve the country, we as a nation actually suffer more economically by denying opportunities than by making those opportunities available. So these are folks who have essentially earned those opportunities. 
and their ability to contribute to the country's economic life uh, is at stake. And so when we slam the door shut on, on what is an estimated 65,000 students a year who graduate from high school but face these obstacles to going to college, we're really hurting ourselves uh, economically. So we've gotten a couple questions on things like timing and marrying it up with another bill. Um, Frank Vargas asks, when is the DREAM Act going to get voted on in the House and the Senate, and what are the chances of it passing? And Nico Navarrete asks, what are the actual prospects of this bill actually passing, either as a standalone or married with another bill? So maybe you can address both of those. These are great questions, uh, and I don't have precise answers to them. We are in now what's called the lame duck session of the Congress. Uh, in fact, Congress is back in session this week. So we know um, that the lame duck session is going to uh, take place this week and into December. We don't know how long Congress will be in, but it will happen by definition sometime within the next month. We don't know whether the House or the Senate is going to go first in taking up the DREAM Act. We do know that we had an opportunity for a vote in the DREAM Act in the Senate several weeks ago as an amendment to the Defense Department bill. Um, and there was a vote on proceeding to that bill which failed. And so that, was, that debate on the Senate floor was about a lot of different things because the DREAM Act was just a part of the bill that was being uh, brought forward. What we do know now is that in the Senate, the DREAM Act is likely to be brought up as a freestanding bill, which means that uh, uh, the majority leader will move to bring the DREAM Act to the floor and there will be uh, a vote on uh, proceeding to the bill and hopefully if that succeeds a vote on the overall bill. So that gives us a clean opportunity at a vote on the DREAM Act on its merits in the Senate. Um, we don't know exactly when we expect that vote to happen. Uh, it could be as soon as this week or it could be another week or even two. Uh, and the same holds true for the House. We're not, it could come up at any point while they're in session during this lame duck session but we don't know exactly, uh, exactly when it's going to come up. So for people who are engaged in this debate, who want to be involved, this is a very pivotal time. Um, if you've been following press coverage about the DREAM Act, you'll know that there's a lot of debate about it, a lot of people writing editorials for newspapers. Uh, there are a lot of varying opinions about that. So for people in particular who are students, who are parts of this population, or who know people who are part of this population, this is an important moment, an educational moment, to help people understand what the DREAM Act is all about and to make sure that it's well understood as Congress approaches these votes. So one question that we've been getting is um, from a number of different folks is um, what is the President and the Administration doing to secure both Democratic and Republican votes to pass the DREAM Act? So the DREAM Act has always been a bipartisan bill. There's always been at least, uh, uh, at least one and sometimes many uh, co-sponsors from both sides of the aisle. And that continues to be true. Uh, Senator Luger, along with Senator Dur Durbin, a Republican and a Democrat, are the principal sponsors in the Senate, for example. Uh, and we know that there are seven Republicans in the Senate who have voted for the DREAM Act in the past. Some of them have also been co-sponsors of the DREAM Act in the past. So these are folks who we know are believers in the DREAM Act, but we don't know whether or not they'll vote for the DREAM Act this time around. If they do, we think we have a very, very good chance of winning. Uh, but we, the honest answer is we don't know if these folks will step forward to support the DREAM Act right now. And so, um, and in the House we haven't had an opportunity for a vote recently, so it's less clear exactly where the votes are, but we do know that there are Republicans in the House of Representatives who have previously been co-sponsors of the DREAM Act. Um, and so we have an opportunity for those votes. What's very clear is that we need 60 votes in the Senate. And in order to get to 60, we're going to need some Republicans to come forward and support the DREAM Act. So obviously, we're focused on the folks who have voted for it before. There is some focus on the senators who were not in the Senate when the DREAM Act came up before, um, who have an opportunity uh, to vote for it for the first time now. Um, and so we have engaged uh, members of the President's Cabinet. Secretary Duncan, for example, is taking a lead in making sure um, uh, that people understand how important the DREAM Act is from an educational perspective. We know that it's part of the Defense Department's strategic plan. Uh, the Department of Homeland Security is also engaged, and the Secretary there is also helping uh, make calls and engage in advocacy on this issue. So we're in kind of an all-hands-on-deck moment here in the administration involving multiple agencies. The President himself is engaged, and we're going to do everything we can to, to uh, lay the groundwork and create the space for people who are, who know this population of students um, to do what they know is the right thing to do. 
Um, and so we are hopeful of bipartisan support. Getting to 60 in the Senate is never easy. Um, I wish I could say that we were guaranteed success, but it, there's, there are no guarantees in this business. And so this is, that's why this is such an important moment. This is why we're doing things like this web chat, and there are a host of activities like this every day to make sure we create a groundswell and create momentum to create the space for the people who support this to step forward and vote for it. So a couple of questions on comprehensive immigration reform and, and how this fits into what that means. So comprehensive immigration reform is the broader immigration agenda. We have a broken immigration system. The reason we have 10 million undocumented people, including these DREAM Act students, living and working in the United States uh, is because we have a system that hasn't worked uh, for many years. And the comprehensive immigration reform is a strategy to uh, ask the Congress, it's essentially a legal a proposal to change the law, to fix what's broken about our immigration system. So that means uh, changing the way that we enforce the laws, and the, that we have right now a series of laws that, that are very challenging to enforce and often don't make sense, that clog up the system and make it hard for us to, to do what we think law enforcement priorities dictate that we should do. So there's an enforcement piece of that agenda. There's a piece having to do with the 10 million people who were here. It doesn't make sense to try to expend the resources to deport everybody who's here illegally, to try to remove 10 million people from the country. So it provides an opportunity for po people to get on the right side of the law by paying taxes and learning English and fulfilling a host of other requirements. And then there are changes to the legal immigration system so that it flows, that we get rid of uh, backlogs that contribute to the problems that we have with our immigration system. So the president is deeply committed to reforming our immigration laws. We, we must have a policy that works. And so while we have been, uh, haven't been successful in generating the bipartisan support that we needed in these first two years in office, uh, it's going to continue to be a priority. Uh, this is something that we, we believe we're here to fix uh, the most vexing problems that the country faces, and this is one of them. So we're going to keep at it until we get this job done. So Mike uh, Robinette um, asks, at what point do we start enforcing our immigration laws to stop illegals from coming rather than making programs that encourage more to come? How about securing our poor southern border first? That's a great question. Um, uh, I would not agree, I guess, with the premise of the question that the DREAM Act actually encourages people to come because it only applies to people who are already here. So nobody who might be making the decision to come to the United States is necessarily going to benefit, is, is going to benefit at all from the DREAM Act. Um, we are heavily, heavily invested in immigration enforcement. and In fact, there are now more resources at the border in terms of, of personnel uh, and equipment than at any time in our history. Um, and in fact, the uh, appreh apprehensions of migrants have, are going down just as interdiction of drugs and arms uh, uh, and, uh, and money, not just from now, south to north, but also from north to south. Interdictions of those things are going up. So we are heavily invested uh, in enforcement, but the problem is that enforcement by itself doesn't fix what's wrong with our immigration system. We have a set of laws that doesn't work, and in order to really make sure that we're securing the border and making sure that we are choosing who comes to this country as an immigrant, we need Congress to act. We need an immigration reform. The folks who say, well, we ought to just do enforcement first, um, those folks have really dominated the debate now for more than 10 years. In 1996, uh, Congress passed, the Republican Congress passed an immigration reform that was all about enforcement and increased dramatically the uh, resources going to the border. If enforcement by itself worked as a strategy, we wouldn't be having this discussion right now. What we need instead is a legal reform to make sure that we have a system that works, and that's what comprehensive immigration reform is about. So we're getting uh, quite a few questions and comments about why we need 60 votes to, to move to this legislation. So I think, and not just 50, so I think maybe you going into a little bit of an explanation on Senate procedure. I wish it weren't true that we need 60 votes, but um, what's going to happen, because it's happened on pretty much everything that's gone through the Senate uh, in the last couple of years, is that the sponsors of the bill and the majority leader will bring the bill up for a vote, and somebody, and that somebody is likely to be on the Republican side of the aisle, will filibuster. Um, and when you filibuster, what essentially you're doing is extending debate. And in order to, you can debate the bill indefinitely until somebody stops you. And the way to stop you is what's called a cloture motion. 
And that's what stops a filibuster. And in order for cloture to pass, you need 60 votes under Senate procedure. So that's why we know we have a majority of the Senate with, uh, that supports the DREAM Act. Um, but unfortunately, we also know that opponents of the DREAM Act are going to filibuster the bill. And so what that does is raise the vote threshold to 60 votes. Uh, so as a practical matter, if we want to see the DREAM Act enacted into law, we need 60. Great. So Lucia Vasquez asks, is there a chance that, uh, that Obama makes an executive order to pass the DREAM Act in case it does not pass during the lame duck session? I wish uh, uh, that that were possible, but it's not. Uh, for, for in order to change the law in this way, Congress has to act. That's what Congress is for. And that's why we have to fight for the votes to make sure the DREAM Act passes. Um, unfortunately, the executive powers of the president don't allow him to waive what Congress does. Uh, and Congress makes the immigration laws in this country. Um, and so for that, in order to pass the DREAM Act or an immigration reform, we have to have action in the Congress. So we're getting also quite a few questions on what people can do to help um, in these next couple of days. So those are great questions. And there are a number of organizations around the country that are very heavily engaged. So I encourage you to look for some of those. Uh, as a member of the White House staff, I can't ask anyone to reach out to Congress or to lobby the Congress, so I won't. But I will say that there is a lot of misunderstanding out there about what the DREAM Act is about. And there are a lot of organizations that are engaged in um, telling the story of DREAM Act students because when you're actually talking about specific individuals with names and histories and faces, it's really hard to say some of the kind of ugly stuff that gets said about passing these kinds of proposals. So we need help educating people about what the DREAM Act is about. We need help demonstrating that there's momentum and that there's a broad base of support. Uh, that while the DREAM Act students themselves have been perhaps some of the most compelling advocates I've ever seen, there are all kinds of other people who are not directly affected by this themselves, who are also spokespeople, who are also engaged, who are also helping educate through their religious congregations, through their community organizations, on their campuses, uh, there's all kinds of ways that folks can reach out. Uh, if you listen to talk radio, there's a conversation about it going on there. If you read newspapers, there's letters to the editor that are being written. Uh, we're asking people to respond and to make it clear that there uh, is tremendous support out there for proposals like the DREAM Act and to help people understand exactly what it means. Great. Um, John Paul Salvaggio asks, how will the DREAM Act be funded? So the DREAM Act doesn't necessarily require funding in order to implement. Um, uh, the, I mean, I guess the Department of Homeland Security will need to process people who qualify for the DREAM Act. And there is likely to be an application fee like there is for every other immigration process. And um, the U.S. Customs and uh, Immigration Service, or U.S. Citizenship and Immigration Service, which is the agency which would be processing these applications, will charge a fee. And, the, and they're fee-based. And so the fee will cover the costs of implementing. So again, if you want to ask a question, I think we have about um, seven or eight minutes left. Um, uh, go to whitehouse.gov forward slash live. Um, we've gotten a couple of questions from people about um, detention center reforms, um, enforcement um, under the Obama administration. Can you address some of those? Yeah, so there is, as I mentioned, there's a whole lot that needs to be changed about the way immigration works in this country. We have right now a very enforcement focused set of laws which are, in fact, so enforcement focused that they have done things like clog up the courts and detention centers. And unfortunately, the agency, the Department of Homeland Security, uh, which was created in the last administration, frankly, doesn't have the best uh, track record up until now for managing its detention process. So one of the first things that Secretary Napolitano did when she uh, was uh, asked to serve and be in charge of the agency was to uh, uh, get experts to study exactly what was happening in the detention system and to propose a series of reforms to make sure that we're using those resources wisely and that people are being tre uh, treated in a way that's consistent with our values when they're in immigration detention. Um, and so those changes are underway. We have a lot to do to make sure uh, that, we, that, that we implement them in the way that we intend, but that has been an imp uh, important priority at the department because there were so many really quite severe problems in the detention system. On the enforcement side, um, we, uh, ICE, which is uh, uh, Immigration Customs Enforcement, has established a clear set of priorities, which you can find, by the way, on the DHS, Department of Homeland Security website, 
um, which establishes that if you've got a population of, of 10 million people, you can't just, I mean, it's an impossible task. It's a huge ocean of folks that are subject to immigration enforcement. You have to make strategic choices about how you use your enforcement resources. So ICE has laid out a, a strategy that essentially prioritizes people who have been convicted of crimes as the principal targets for enforcement. So we get a certain amount of resources from the Congress every year to remove people from the United States. We're trying to expend those resources so that we maximize the number of people who are criminals who we remove from this country. And so uh, in the last year, the number of people who are convicted of crimes that we've removed has gone up by 71%. And the number of people who are not criminals that we have removed from the country has gone down by about 23%. So we're trying to use our enforcement resources as wisely as possible. Uh, we're trying to uh, make implementation choices, strategic choices that are kind of consistent with the best law enforcement practices. But most importantly, we're trying to reform the law so that what we have is a workable series of laws so that people who come to this country come legally uh, and that uh, employers have the ability to make sure that the people that they hire are here legally in a way that doesn't inconvenience them or their uh, folks in their workforce. Uh, so th that's why we're trying to reform the system of laws. We are right now implementing a system that doesn't work and trying to make the best judgments that we can within those constraints. But the real answer to fixing what's broken here is for Congress to work with the administration in reforming our immigration system. So we have a couple minutes left. Um, I think uh, it would be helpful. Jasmine asks, why, uh, can you please clarify again why this is not a free ride? Um, if you can address that and then maybe one more time talk about timing for the vote, um, how many votes that we think that um, the DREAM Act may have right now um, and what people can do to help. So the reason the DREAM Act isn't a free ride is because there are a host of requirements that these students need to fulfill in order to qualify for the DREAM Act. The most important of these, are they, so they have to have been uh, come, they have to have been in the country for five years, they have to have been brought by their parents when they were younger than 15, but most importantly they need to go to school or serve in the military. So this is really about the contribution that they're going to make. And so nobody's granting anything to anybody who's just sitting there and not making a contribution. In fact, the whole point here is that these are students who are poised to make a great contribution, either through continuing their educations or through serving the country. And we're, making, we're, we're, we're giving them the opportunity to do that. It doesn't grant them funds. Uh, it simply gives them an opportunity to, to, to earn their own way forward. And then, I'm sorry, the second part of the question? Kind of the timing again, how many votes we think that we have and, and how the people can help. So the timing is we expect to vote in uh, the Senate uh, and, and the House within the next several weeks. Could be as soon as this week, could take another week or even two. Um, we don't know exactly how many votes we have because there are a number that the way these bodies work, you sort of, people don't declare themselves until they have to. We know we're over 50 votes in the Senate. The question is, how close are we to 60? Um, and uh, I, I, we don't know the answer to that yet because there's the, the pressure still needs to build for those folks who are on the fence to declare themselves. In the House, the Congressional Hispanic Caucus, among others, uh, and the existing House leadership are uh, making the rounds, doing calls to assess where the votes are. We're confident that we're in a reasonably good place, but there's a lot more work to do to make sure um, that we get the support that we need in order to pass the DREAM Act, which is why we are making sure as many people as possible know about this incredibly important debate. Well, thank you, Cecilia, very much, and thank you, everyone, for, for being on today's web chat. You know, stay tuned on whitehouse.gov uh, for additional updates from the White House Office of Public Engagement as this continues to move forward. Um, thanks for all your questions, um, and hope to hear from you soon. Thanks.